Hey guys, welcome back to Sword and Shield, a deconstruction and plausible, enticing arguments. We haven't done uh, Sword and Shield in a while. I'm on the road, obviously. That's why I look kind of crazy. It's the morning, woke up, had this on my mind, wanted to share it because of our deconstruction moment. And I think this might be helpful for somebody. Let's just start by reading one verse. All right, this is the Apostle Paul. This is in Colossians chapter two, verse four. And um, actually, let's read verse one first. Paul says this, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, I don't know how to say that, and for all who have not seen me face to face. So first, before we read the scripture, I want to read, we start with one, Paul saying, I want you to know how great a struggle I'm in conflict over this. I'm wrestling with this. You can feel this sort of agony that he has for these people. He's writing this, this letter. And here's the verse that I want to share with you. Are you ready? Verse four. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Another translation says enticing arguments. I think you can get an idea of what this is. I'm going to read all four verses in a second. Let me tell you why it's on my mind. We're in a moment of deconstruction in the American church. And I believe this is in the Western church in general, if I've understood correctly. We're in this moment. And I think a lot of people don't know there's a lot of disagreements about how we are to handle this deconstruction going on. Some people have said, I disagree with this, but let's just, let's just say it. Some people have said, Hey, maybe they said to people like me or whoever, Lisa Childers or some of my friends are doing these things, uh, speaking to this issue. You're making too big a deal about this deconstruction thing. Maybe they would view it more like a parent. So if you're a parent and your kid is going through some sort of phase, you know, you're like, why are they dressing like this all of a sudden? And, and you do want to know, but you don't want to overemphasize it. So you're making such a big deal of it. Now you're kind of like, you're freaking out and you make your kid feel like they can't, you know, be themselves or whatever it may be. I understand that. As it per pertains to deconstruction, I meet a lot of pastors and, and leaders who think you're making such a big deal about deconstruction that you're making people feel like they can't ask questions and it's never allowed. You're going to just come down them with a hammer or something like that. So therefore, you should leave it alone. Quit making a big deal about it. It's just all about, you know, uh, it's all about the gospel. Or it's all about just faith, you know, or th something like that. I think that this is a really interesting verse that supports what I believe we are supposed to do. A, yes, people should be able to ask any questions they want. Any question you want to ask, any confusion you have, there is a biblical answer for that. And pastors, leaders, uh, whoever, parents, home group leaders, youth group leaders, we should be prepared for an answer for that. But I think that Paul is giving us reason to say, hey, hey, hey I, I, I am working, I am in conflict over this. I am doing everything I can do to persuade you of the truth so that you don't go down this road into what he calls plausible arguments. I think that's really interesting because sometimes there is something about de the deconstruction arguments, the progressive Christianity arguments that I go, I can see why you'd say that. It, it's not that it's completely implausible. I think it's wrong. And, and, and we, but we need to combat it. So let's just read. So this is Colossians 2, 1 through 4. You ready? For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea. I don't know how to say it. And for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. I think this is really interesting because sometimes in what happens in, in the deconstruction argument is that people say, hey, it's not about having all these disagreements about arguments. It's only about, almost like it's only about faith and redevoting yourself to Christian orthodoxy. So don't have the arguments. I disagree with that. I think we need to have the arguments. We need to make a case from the word of God for why we believe what we believe. And I think that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, no, no. In Jesus Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, there's an interesting thing here also. It's plausible. They are enticing arguments. They are enticing arguments. There's something about it that can sound pious. One of the things I hear in the progressive Christianity movement a lot is what they will do is 
they will make what they call the love of God, because the Bible says that God is love, and he is. So they will then take the love of God, which is an attribute of God, and then they will make it supreme over all of God's other attributes. So in other words, they are taking something true, but they are overemphasizing it in a, I mean, not that you could overemphasize the love of God, but they're emphasizing it in an incorrect way. They're emphasizing the love of God in a way that de-emphasizes the fact that God is a God of justice, right? Because that, that is also an attribute of God. He is a God of justice. So they go, no, no, it's love first and everything else under that. And so where they end up going down a train is, is all of a sudden God, that, that God would never come and judge sinners. He would never bring judgment because he just loves people too much. You see what I'm saying? So it, it's a plausible argument. It's an enticing argument and it seems pious because what they could do is say, no, you just understand, you don't understand how much God loves people. And so it becomes a sort of enticing argument to believe because it sounds very pious, but in the end, it's actually a prideful argument because what they are, they are, they are redefining who God is based on their own desires, which is we all we know is pride. Now, let's go back to Colossians because they do something similar in Colossians. Number one, if I've understood this correctly, as you keep reading through uh, Colossians 2, what you begin to see is that some of these, quote, enticing arguments or plausible arguments, you might say, are arguments basically for um, ceremonial washings and things like that. So it's basically, uh, it's basically taking Old Testament ceremonial laws, okay, ceremonial laws, which were really to do with like things that you couldn't eat, um, all the washings and then all the, in like types and shadows, they are shadows and things that pointed to the Messiah, but in the Messiah in Christ, we actually have now all of those shadows in, in, in Jesus Christ, in the bodily form of Jesus Christ. So what they're doing is they're coming back in and saying, no, no, no. If you want to be a, the best Christian, if you want to be the, the, the greatest Christian, you need to go back and do these ordinances. Um, which were, I guess what we would say is in, in a way they're, they're, they're being legalistic. They're, they're taking things that God does not require us to do, um, in the new covenant because they have, they're done. They have been fulfilled in Christ Jesus in the ceremonial laws. And now saying, no, if you really want to be super Christian, you will go back and do all these other things. And so Paul is going to war. <laughs> Paul's going to war over it. And what he's saying is it's, well, you might think those are pious things to do. So I'm such a good person. I just don't eat that kind of thing because I love God too much. And now I'm putting that yoke, that burden on all of you other Christians. And so Paul is saying, well, that might seem pious, but it's actually not pious. It's actually prideful because you, you, you're, you're putting new, new rules onto the Christian life. Uh, that God is not requiring and you are fulfilling those rules and you think that it earns you some kind of favor with God. That is not what grace is. That is what legalism is. That is what tr uh, religious tradition is. So that's one thing. But the other thing that I find really interesting, if you can go to 2 verse 18, um, Paul says this, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism um, and worship of angels, asceticism is a really big word, but that's to do with like these, the purity of these laws that I just referred to, right? So it's this, um, I'm abstaining from all these things, um, you know, uh, because they make me super duper pure. And he's saying, yeah, you don't need to, you don't need to, um, you don't need to refrain from eating meat or certain kinds of whatever. You see, I think you get what I'm talking about. It's just a big word. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Now that is re also really interesting because if I'm reading it correctly, what I think it sounds like is happening is um, I was also reading a little bit of Matthew Henry commentary on this for people that were be beginning to say, okay, here's the thing. We can't come to God directly because we are, we are so bad, we are so messed up, and God is so high, and we are so low, that you don't wanna be so prideful as to think that you can come into the throne of grace, the throne of the Holy of Holies, if you will, into the throne room of grace and just talk to God on your own because he is too high. So we need mediators 
those mediators would be angels, some some form of, of other various created beings in the heavenly realms and yada yada. They will be our mediators to God and we will go to those mediators, to those angels and because I had visions of all these things and in that vision I realized that I go to this mediator, that mediator goes to God for me because I am such a, a humble person that I just don't view myself as worthy of coming to God on my own. Do you see how that sounds pious but it's false piety because it's not real, it's not true. And I think that that is an interesting thing that what Paul's saying is, is they're puffed up with, they're puffed up without reason by their sensuous minds. They, they're acting like they're being um, humble, but in reality, they're not being humble. They're being arrogant because they're going against what Christ has taught us. We do, we know what, we don't need a mediator. Jesus is now our mediator. He is our high priest. We come to the throne room. In fact, we come boldly into the throne room, the Bible actually says. And so you are not being more pious or more humble by not coming boldly to the throne of grace because that's what the word tells us to do. I think that that's an interesting parallel to some of the, what I consider to be the false piety of some of the deconstruction movement. And so what I want to encourage you guys in is this. I believe that we should have an answer for our faith. I believe we should have an answer. I don't think that we need to run like some of people who I love and that you know. I've met, I've met pastors and influencers like this or, I, or I've connected with them online. People that say, John, you're freaking out about deconstruction. There's no reason to be doing that. And it's not about all knowledge. It's not about knowledge and winning arguments and having all these great reasonable arguments, almost like, almost like you're doing too much apologetics because it's not about that. It's about faith. They just don't have faith in God anymore and you need to love them and not make too much of a big deal about it. I think that Paul would say different. I think the apostle is saying, no, 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 no. These are enticing arguments and I am in conflict and I am wrestling with you because I do not want to see you go down the road for these things. Some of them sound pious. Some of them sound reasonable. They might be enticing, but they are wrong. And it takes you away from the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that his word is real. Things like that. I think it's very, very important. So let me just say this as we're ending this very short sword and, sword and shield. A, you don't have to be a genius to read the Bible. You don't have to be an academic to understand the Bible. And you don't need to feel like you got to have an answer for every single thing in the whole world or things are going to go bad. At the same time, I want to encourage you to wrestle and contend for the faith with the people in your life that are asking these questions. If you don't know the answers, that's okay. Dig into the word of God to find the answers. Because I think Paul would say, hey, they're plausible. They are enticing, but they are leading people away. Jesus Christ has died Jesus Christ has given us everything we need. We have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What is one of the main things the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit, I was just reading um, A.W. Tozer's the, the Pursuit of God, which is my favorite book of all time. I'm reading it again. And as Tozer said, you, you get on your knees before the Lord, you open up the Bible, and you ask the Holy Spirit to bring you closer to God. And as you begin to read the Bible, you will begin to understand the truth. Do not be persuaded by false arguments, but instead let this book right here, the Bible, let it transform your mind that you would become a deeper follower of Jesus Christ. His word never, ever fails. Have a great week. Read the Bible.